Okay, our, uh, as we mentioned, our Vacation Bible School starts tonight, and uh, we hope that you will plan to be a part of uh, every single session of that, Sunday through Wednesday night. But fearless is, uh, is the theme that is being used uh, for this year's uh, Vacation Bible School. Uh, it's a uh, theme and a, a curriculum that's been developed by Apologetics Press, and so uh, I wanted to kind of use that as uh, kind of the springboard of what uh, we will be talking about uh, this, uh, this morning. Uh, as a part of the Vacation Bible School, there will be uh, a variety of New Testament characters uh, that are going to be studied uh, as, as they talk about those who were fearless uh, in their service to the Lord. Can you think of what those New Testament characters might be that are going to be a part of Vacation Bible School? Are there any m- subliminal messages that are coming to you uh, at this moment that think this is the, this is, this is, any, any ideas? Paul, good, all right, any others come to mind? Luke, excellent, all right, that's half of them. Pa- Peter, who's the other one? All right, the, the, the pair, the couple. All right, so those are the obvious four because they're staring you right in the face. Now, who else in the Bible, and you don't have to limit yourself to New Testament, but who else in the Bible would you describe as someone who was fearless? Ananias? Uh, which one? Um, I assume you're talking about the one who went and talked to Saul of Tarsus and not the guy who lied to Peter. Uh, but uh, just clarifying which Ananias we're talking about. Uh, although I guess Ananias who lied to Peter was fearless too. He didn't care to lie to God. Who cares? Uh, he, didn't, he wasn't fearful. Uh, who else? David. Was he fearless? At times. Uh, you stand before Goliath, he didn't have fear. Who else? Moses? Somebody was said up over here. Stephen? Daniel? Noah? Noah? Who is that in the back? Joshua and Caleb. Good. Anybody else you think of as being fearless in their service to the Lord? Jesus, always a good answer in Bible class. Uh, Did you say Job? I mean, we could just go on and on, right? Um, What I want to do today is, uh, is to focus in on some characters that we know very well. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought about trying to find some, some of those obscure characters and study them, but I want us to talk about some individuals we know very well, uh, individuals we talk a lot about, especially in children's Bible classes, but just because we talk about them in children's Bible classes doesn't mean that they're uh, off limits uh, for, uh, for us who are grown-ups uh, and uh, more mature, or at least hope we are. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. And uh, I want us to use uh, a study from some characters in the book of Daniel to talk about some, some applications that we can make of being fearless. Uh, do, do, we, do we need to be fearless? I mean, that's the whole point of this Vacation Bible School is not to just study these Bible characters, but, to, but it's to make application. Do we need to be fearless uh, in our service to the Lord? Is that easy? No, not always. Uh, we, we, we struggle with that. A lot, and so I want us to. Uh, uh, we probably won't have time to look at everything that I want to talk about this morning, uh, but I want us to start in Daniel chapter one, and I want us to. Uh, and if we have time, we'll get to Daniel chapter three, and I'll be really shocked if we get to Daniel chapter six. I don't think we'll get there, um, but I want us to start in Daniel chapter one, talk about some Bible characters who were fearless, uh, who were taken into a strange land. When we read about these characters in Daniel chapter 1, we read about these Jewish young men. What happened to these Jewish young men in Daniel chapter 1? Were they taken away from home? Would that be easy? Look at what happens. And and, and the history of this is described in those first few verses. It's the third year of Jehoiakim, uh, the, the, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And in that year, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land uh, of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the the treasure house of his God. Now start in verse 3. 
the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to not just bring some of the articles of gold from the temple, that was nice, but he wanted him to bring some of the children of Israel, some of the king's descendants, some of the nobles, some of the young men, and bring them to him, in verse 4, in whom there was no blemish, but were good-looking and gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace. So here comes, here comes Nebuchadnezzar into, into uh, Jerusalem, Judah, into Judah, besieges it, surrounds it, captures it, and carries off captives over to Babylon. And who does he want the most? He wants the older, wiser uh, individuals to come and to teach him some things, right? Mm. He wants the cream of the crop of the young men, the teenagers, the 14, 15, 16-year-olds taken away from home and taken into a strange land. Where would you be? And, and mentally and emotionally, where would you be if you were one of these young men taken away from home and taken to Babylon? Is it, are, you think you're on vacation? Is, it, is this exciting? Good, I'm away from mom and dad. Finally, I get what I want out of life. And you're taken to Babylon. Um, would you be fearful or fearless? Would you might be fearful? Uh, I would be. I mean, some of you are tough. I'm not. I, I, I'd be scared to death about what's going on. So they get over there and look in verse 4. What, what are they going to do in verse 4? They're going to teach them a foreign language. How many of you are good at foreign languages? How many of you love foreign? Okay, nobody raised their hands. That's embarrassing. Um, okay, so uh, they're taken over there, and they say, we're going to teach you a new language. And it's not that you're going to get college credit for this, all right? It, it's not that you can get, get a degree in this. We're going to force you to learn our language uh, there at the end of verse 4. And, and not only that, we're going to teach you our culture, not just the language, but the literature of the Chaldeans. We are going to immerse you into a foreign culture that is totally different than anything you've known growing up as a Jew. Is that going to be fun? Is that going to be easy? Oh, and by the way, drop down to verse 6. Not only are we going to do that, but uh, from among those who were the, from the sons of Judah were Daniel, but uh, they decided, no, you know what? We're not going to call you by these names anymore. Your names used to be Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. We don't know Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah very well, do we? At least not by those names. So no, we're going to change your names. So to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Oh, there's the names we know. So we're going to take you over there, and we're going to give you all new names. How would you like somebody to just give you a new name? I don't like your name. I'm going to give you another name. Would that be okay with you? So all of their names from Judah, their Jewish names were tied to God. Their name, the very names were tied to God. Babylon says, no, we don't like that. We don't want your names tied to the God of heaven. We're going to give you new names. And we're going to tie your new names to our gods. So it's not just, oh, we're not going to call you David anymore. We're going to call you... We're going to call you Dan. We're going to call you Edward. We're going to call you Stephen. It's not we're just going to make something up and just confuse you. We're not just changing your name. We're changing your identity. You're not tied to the God of heaven anymore. You're tied to our gods. You're ours. You belong to us, and you're going to worship our gods. Where would you be if you're one of these, one of these guys? Mentally? Emotionally? Where are you going to be? Are you scared? Uh, are, you, are you a little uncertain about what in the world is going on? Not only are they doing all of this, but they're instructed to eat and drink some things up in verse 5. They're instructed to eat and drink some things that you read about it in verse 5, but then you get down to verse 8, and Daniel says, no, this is going to defile me. What does that, what does that indicate? Is it okay for me to eat and drink this? I'm a Jew. I'm not tied to your gods. 
I'm tied to the God of heaven. And if I eat and drink this, it will defile me in the eyes of God. If you're over there in Babylon, you're one of these guys. Do you have a human reason to be afraid? I'm not talking about your relationship with God. I'm just talking about your human emotions. Do you have a human reason to be afraid? Yes. And, and you would have been, and they would have been. So how did these guys respond? Remember, they're teenagers, all right? They're 14, 15, 16. They're, 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 not, they're not grown men who have been seasoned by life and, ex, and experiences. They're, they're 14, 15, 16 years old. Daniel's going to be in Babylon for 70 years. When you get to the end of the book of Daniel, he's, uh, now he's a seasoned man. Uh, he's in his 80s by the, end of, by the time you get to the end of the book. How do these guys handle this? How do these young men deal with such a fearful situation? I, and and that's, that's obviously what us, want us to see, and we're going we're gonna to make some applications as we, as we go through this. Uh, and, and at the end of it. But when they got over there, ha- have, you ever, have you ever gone on vacation and maybe, don't, don't answer this out loud, have you ever gone on vacation and, well, maybe you didn't go to church on vacation as often as you did when you were in town? Uh, you know, maybe you looked for a place and you couldn't find, or maybe you didn't look for a place and you said, well, I'm just kind of on vacation. Uh, sometimes we, we go out of town and we're not always the same out of town as we are in town and sometimes our habits change but did their habits change did their desire to serve God and to be aware of the will of God change no look in verse 8 where we see their wisdom and their courage Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank Think about this for a minute. We're going to teach you a new language. Is that so bad? Uh, we're going to teach you. Is, is there anything wrong with Daniel learning a new language? Is there anything wrong with Daniel or, or, or the other three, three guys? Anything wrong with them learning their literature back up in verse 4? Understanding their culture. Anything wrong with any of that? Uh, as, as you step through the things, and is there anything inherently wrong with, well, we're going to change your name. You're, you're, you're going to be called Belteshazzar now. Anything inherently wrong with that? Well, it's just my name. It's what you call me. But now we're getting down to something where it violates the law of God, and Daniel says, okay, I'll learn your language. I'll learn your literature. I'll let you call me whatever you want to call me. But when it comes to the law of God, We're not budging on that. Isn't that interesting? This is where he draws the line. And so in his wisdom, and and I say his, and and he's speaking for for these other guys as well, but in his wisdom he recognizes that if I do this, this violates the law of God. But it doesn't just stop at what he realizes is a violation of the will of God. He's got courage to step up and to say something. Do we sometimes have wisdom to recognize Something's wrong, I don't need to do this. But do we always have the courage to draw a line? To say, I'm not going to cross this line. And so what does Daniel do? In humility, the end of verse 8, in humility Daniel comes to them and uh, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Can you imagine, can you imagine this conversation? Goes to the chief of the eunuchs. Uh, I can't eat and drink what you're offering because it will defile me in the eyes of my God. Can you imagine the chief of the eunuchs looking at Daniel like, what? It's just food, buddy. It's just a drink, man. What's your problem? Anybody ever looked at you that way? When you draw a line? I'm, I, no, I don't drink. You don't drink? What's wrong with you? When you draw a line and say, no, I'm, I, 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 I don't watch those kind of movies. You don't watch those kind of movies? You're weird. You ever draw a line and somebody looks at you and they say, what's wrong with you? Daniel's drawing a line. And he's making a request. And it says, we don't want to eat this. Now look at this conversation. Look at verse 9. God had brought Daniel, and we'll talk about this more in just a minute, into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. 
chief of the eunuch said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So who's the chief of the eunuchs concerned about? Himself. Who does he fear? The king. Who does Daniel fear? In a healthy way. Who does Daniel fear? Oh, yeah. You, you fear your king? You respect your king? That's nice. I've got a king in heaven. And I'm more concerned about him than I am about your king. And I'm more concerned about what he has to say than what your king, and, and that's, that's not the conversation, that's not, we don't read that conversation, but I find that interesting. Chief of the eunuch says, I fear my Lord, and Daniel could say, yeah, I do too. But my Lord has a capital L, and yours has a lowercase l. I, feel my, I fear my Lord too. So Daniel said in verse 11 to the, to the steward, so, so now the chief of the eunuchs isn't willing to make a change here. So now Daniel says to the steward, kind of the, the overseer, uh, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel. So he's, you got the chief of the eunuchs, and then you got the steward under the chief of the eunuchs. Chief of the eunuchs isn't willing to budge, so now Daniel talks to the steward of these four men, and he says, please, just put us to the test for ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. Uh, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants." So he consented with them of this, master, of this matter and tested them for 10 days. Would we be willing to do that? Somebody wants us to do something, maybe it's even at work, where we're asked to do something that, that violates the law of God, that crosses a line. Would we be willing to go and say, you know what, how about we do this instead? What about this option? Still accomplishes the end result of what needs to be done. What about this option that doesn't cause me to violate the law of God? So here are these young men. Is this bold? Would you say this is bold for them? It's just easier to go along, isn't it? Let's just go along with stuff. If you go along with stuff, you don't create waves. You don't, get, you don't gather attention you don't want. Let's just go along. Well, we're not going along with something that violates the law of God. We're not, we're, we're not going to defile ourselves. Now, did God take notice of this? Did God notice what's happening here? Did God take care of them in this whole process? I, I, in verse 9, I find it interesting. God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. I don't know how that happened. But through the providence of God, God is taking care of these individuals. When you read the rest of the book of Daniel, does Daniel ever gain uh, a position of authority? Yeah. You read the rest of the book of Daniel, and here's this Jew who takes on a position of authority, not just in the Babylonian empire, but Babylon falls to the Medes and the Persians, and Daniel takes a position of authority in that nation too. How does all that happen? God's watching out for him. Do you believe God's watching out for you? Do you believe God's going to take care of you? Now, does that mean God's going to give you a promotion at work? Does that mean God's going to make you the CEO? No. You know, your wife might let you be the CFO at home, but you might not be the CFO at work. But is, is, does it mean that God's going to give you these great promotions and he's going to pour out all of this great money for you? That, see, that's the way our minds, uh, that's the way our material minds sometimes think. But God, through his providence, is taking care of them. And so start in verse 15. And you drop down to verse 15, and you see that as these individuals are doing the will of God, that they rise above everybody else that's there. So at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter and flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the, steer, the steward took away their portion of delicacies, delicacies and the wine uh, that they were to drink, that was supposed to, and they gave them the vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and, God had under, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought these men, brought all of the captives, all of these young men, uh, after the three years of training 
uh, that they were to go through. So after these three years of training, they're brought before Nebuchadnezzar, verse 19. The king interviewed them. He talked with them. Notice what verse 19 says. And among them all. So this, is not, this, this isn't just all of the Jewish. It's not just the four young men. It's all of the Jewish young men who had been brought. But not just them. It's all captives of all lands that had been brought. And among all of them, verse 19, none was found. Like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all, there's that word again, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Is God taking care of his people? I mean, it's, it's amazing that you read about these guys and they said, look, we don't want to do what you're telling us to do because it will defile us in the eyes of God. What if we do this instead? So that he, he gave them the option. What if we do this instead? This won't cause us to violate the law of God. What if we do this instead? And just test us. Test us on this and see if this won't work. Did it work? Not only did it work, but it caused them to rise above everybody else. If we live right, do right, according to the law of God, if we just follow what the book tells us to do, should that not cause us to rise above others? I'm not talking about in arrogance or in preeminence or, or in greatness. I'm just talking about in life. Should we as Christians, and, and not, again, not the big head here, but should we as Christians not be ten times better than those around us? I mean, and, and it's not that, it's not that, don't take that literally like, well, you know, this, this guy over here was six times better, but here's the Jews and they're ten times better. The, the, the idea of ten times is just completeness, fullness. Followers of God were found to be different, to rise above everybody else. Shouldn't that be us? John. That's right. And, and that's, that's, that's why I want us to look at this today is, you know, as Josh says, here's a government that comes in and starts taking things away from you. Okay, some things don't matter. You know, essentially some things don't matter. But when it comes to your faith and the government starts to want to take things away from you that are connected to your faith, where are we, where are we going to draw the line? And as Josh says, is our faith one of convenience where I just, you know, it's, it's good and as long as things are going my way and, you know, I'm not causing too much, uh, you know, friction or ripples in life, or is it one of conviction that says, nope, I, I, I stand where God stands and I'm not going to budge on this. Now, is that going to cause us some problems in life? Is that going to cause you some problems at work? Yeah, it's going to happen. But what's more important? What was more important to these four young men? My, my faith in God. I'm going to serve my God. And so, th what what are what are some and 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 what what are some points of application? And and Josh Josh has Josh has made the, the, the biggest one uh, in regard to in, in regard to our points of application here. But are we pilgrims today, sojourners in life? Yes, that's what these four young men were. They're pilgrims. They don't they don't live they don't live there. They don't belong there. It's a strange place. Guess what? We don't belong here. I, I, I think sometimes, even as Christians, we've gotten so comfortable and at ease and at home on the earth. We like it here. We like what this earth has to offer us. We want to gather and, and, and to gain as much as we possibly can. This isn't our home. We are pilgrims. We're sojourners. 
And as such, we have a purpose here. And our purpose is not an earthly, gathering all of the earthly things we can, purpose. You know, we sing the songs that says, this world is not my home. We sing the song, but do we, is it in our hearts? Philippians 3 says that our, our citizenship is in heaven. Do you value your American citizenship? Do you value that? Yeah, absolutely. If you go to a foreign country, do you value your American citizenship? I mean, it does, when, when, you, when you visit another country and, and you, you are an American citizen, does that, give you, does that give you some confidence? Does that give you some comfort when you're in another place? Oh, I'm an American citizen. You know, if something were to happen to me, you know, America will watch out for me and look out for me, or whatever it may be. Here I am. I value, I treasure, I love my American citizenship because of what it offers to me. What about my heavenly citizenship? What does that offer me? Does that give me comfort? Does that give me relief and hope in times of struggle? These young men, that's where their mindset was. Sure, you can take us out of our homeland, you can take us to this strange land, but we are first and foremost children of God, and we are more concerned about pleasing Him than anything else. And, and this, this goes along with what Josh was talking about, but there's going to be some things in our life that are going to be out of our control. Have you noticed that? You know been, what's been happening around us lately? Out of our control. But what do I do about it? Go, go over to, we're not going to look at all these verses, but go over to James chapter 1. And, and, and I know you know these verses and could probably quote some of these verses, but I want us to look at them real quick, a couple of them together. Look in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 27. This would be an interesting fill-in-the-blank question to put on a quiz sometime. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. How would the average Christian, if, if you didn't know James 1 and verse 27 was in the Bible, how would the average Christian fill in the blank there? Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. Would you put in there, visit the orphans and the, and the widows in their time of trouble? Would you put that on, that might not be the first thing that comes to your mind. But God puts it on there. But here's what I want to see, obviously, at the end of the verse. And to keep oneself, what? New King James says, unspotted from the world. Anybody have something different? Unstained from the world. Is that easy? Keep yourself unspotted from the world? We live in the world. Keep yourself unspotted and unstained from it? That, that's a challenge. That takes, that takes determination on a daily basis. I am not going, look, well, I don't have it up there, but go over to chapter 4 and verse 4. James chapter 4 and verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is what? Enmity with God. Do we, we have that in our heads? Keep myself unspotted from the world. Becoming a friend of the world makes me an enemy of God. Go over to 1 John chapter 5. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. As John comes to the end of this letter, one of the key words that he's been using throughout the book of 1 John is the word no, uh, and that was some things that they were dealing with, uh, particularly uh, at the time that he wrote this was a, uh, some individuals questioning what you could know uh, and questioning knowledge, and so that's a key word in the book of 1 John. So he ends the book, you look in verse 18, how does verse 18 start? We know. Verse 19 start? We know. Verse 20 start? And we know. Uh, so he's ending that with, look at verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. What does that mean? Have you been born of God? Are you a Christian? Do you sin? Well, well how can this say does not sin? The way that John uses that expression in this book is to talk about a lifestyle, a choice of life uh, that is habitually sinning. So someone who's been born of God, he doesn't, go through life uh, habitually choosing to sin as his lifestyle. But he was born of God, 
Here's what I want you to see. Keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. What does that expression, keeps himself, mean? Maintain self-control? Here I am trying to serve God. I'm a child of God. And what I do in that regard is I keep myself unspotted from the world. I do all that I can to control myself. And when I do, the wicked one does not touch me. Did you know that verse is in the Bible? When I'm trying to do what God tells me to do, when I'm striving in every way to control myself, to keep myself unspotted from the world, the wicked one does not touch me. Does the devil ever bother you? Yeah, on a daily basis. What did James chapter 4 tell us about the devil? Resist the devil and he will do what? He'll flee from you. So is that not what Daniel and we call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because if I call them by their Jewish names, you'd be like, Who, who's that? Is that not what they were doing? Resisting the devil? Is it not what they were doing? Controlling themselves, keeping themselves unspotted from the Babylonian world? There were things in, with, with those men that were out of their control. They could not control that they were taken away from home. They could not control that their liberties were removed. There's some things happening around us today we can't control. Can we control us? Yeah. Can we control what we do, what we, what we allow ourselves to do? And time's, time's flying by here. Um, I can't believe it's 9.37 already. Do we need to be like these young men and seek God's way of escape? Was there a way of escape for these guys? No, you're going to eat our food and drink our wine. And they said, nope, not going to do it. We're going to eat this and we're going to drink this instead. There was a way of escape. Was their way of escape a good way of escape? <coughs> yeah. Did, did, it, did it show them to be a, an inferior person? Oh, you won't, you won't do what we do? Oh, you're, you're so sorry. What did it cause them to do? Rise above. Look for God's way of escape. Is it going to be there every time? Yeah. Uh, do, we, do we need to realize that God's taking care of us? God was taking care of his young men back then. Is he still taking care of us? Yeah. He's going to take care of us all the way through. Do we need to be afraid? Do you not love Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6? What does the passage say? How often is God going to leave you or forsake you? How often is he going to do that? Like, like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, every day he's going to leave you because he's got a siesta time? I mean, how often is God going to leave you or forsake you? Uh, he's, he, on the Sabbath day, right? God's got to have a day of rest. So you're on your own on the Sabbath day. How often? Never leave you nor forsake you. And then the very next verse says, you know what? We will not fear what man can do to us. I wonder if that's true for us. Do we fear what's going on around us? Do we fear liberties that are going to be taken away from us? Do we fear uh, that one day somebody may walk in these doors and try to shut us down in what we're doing in worshiping God? Is that a possibility? Sure it is. What do we do? We keep on doing what God tells us to do. We have had it easy in this country, haven't we? Um, you, you, look, you look throughout history. Here's history in the book of Daniel. You look throughout history on God's people. Have they always had freedom to worship and to serve God? No. It's not that we're wishing that freedom away. But are there some people wishing that freedom away from us? Sure there are. What are we going to do? We need to be fearless followers. So I'm not, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. All right, we only have about five minutes. Go, go, to, go to Daniel chapter 3. You all have any comments about Daniel chapter 1? Any thoughts or additions? Phil. Okay, good. Let, let me repeat what Phil said. That fearless is not the absence of fear, uh, but is, it, is, it is the determination to do what's right uh, and what God wants, even in the presence of 
fear and, and difficulties. So what was your what was the other thing? So fearless doesn't mean you got to run into a wall, Phil says, uh, but, uh, but allowing God to work things out uh, in, uh, in God's order, but continuing to march along and do what's right uh, in the process and, and let God take care of, uh, of the timing on things. M Mickey? Feed your faith and your fears will starve to death. Well, right, right, and that's 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 the determination of how, how do we how do we train our conscience. Mickey says it's not easy to go along with the crowd if if your conscience is bothering you. Well, for some of us, uh, and I use the word us in a broad stroke, and I'm not you know for some individuals, you know we we've allowed our conscience to not bother us anymore. Uh, we we've just we've we've put that pushed that to the side so that it's so that it's not bothering us. Carolyn, did you have a comment too? And that, that's, that's the key. What does God's word say? How, how, do we, how are we going to live by it? How are we going to stick with it? Anybody else have any thoughts or comments on this? We don't have time, obviously. We only have three minutes on, on Daniel chapter 3. But isn't Daniel chapter 3 one of your favorite stories in the Bible? Uh, I mean, just the book of Daniel, uh, at least we, we know the first six chapters a whole lot better than we know the last six chapters because the first six chapters have these awesome stories. But, it, but with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were they in a pressure situation? I mean, they, in, in a literal sense, uh, they were in a pressure cooker uh, for a period of time uh, in a very real way. Did they allow that, did, were, did they allow that to manipulate them and to press them in a direction where they compromised on their faith? Maybe just a little, maybe just a little. Can you imagine being one of those men, and, and, and picture the scene, picture the scene where, where uh, Nebuchadnezzar's got his 90-foot gold idol that he has built, 90 feet tall. Um, I think the top of our steeple is somewhere around 60 feet. 90 feet tall. And he brings everybody in there, and he says, all right, when you hear the sound of the music, you're going to all bow down. And they play the music, and the Bible says, all the people bowed down. How many people are there? I don't know. Hundreds? Yeah, easily. Thousands? Likely. All gathered before this image. Everybody bows down, except those three guys. Tell me. How hard was it for them when every, literally, not, not, not figuratively, not just metaphorically, when everybody else bows down? How hard was it for them not to, not to, I'm not going to go all the way, I mean, come on, don't be crazy. I'm not going to go all the way down, but wow, I'm really standing out here, I, I and maybe if I just duck down a little bit, it won't be so noticeable. In, in your, the Bible doesn't say this, but in your mind, did they even flex? In your mind, when everybody else went down, did, 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 do you picture them? I mean, do you even picture their knees giving it all? I, the Bible doesn't say it. In my imagination, nope. My imagination, you know, they're just maybe, you know, straightening up even a little bit more. I'm not going down, and I'm so far not going down, I'm going to stand up a little bit more. What does that do? Does that draw attention to you? Everybody's attention was on them. Can you imagine being the people standing, or not standing anymore, kneeling around them? Can you, can you imagine being somebody, and everybody else is down except for the, can you imagine the peer pressure around them? I mean, it's like maybe somebody out looking, hey, guy, are you deaf? They played the music, get down, get, get, would you get down? You're going to draw attention. Can you imagine not just everybody else doing it, but it, individuals around them say, get down, 
Come on, get down. They, they already know what's going to happen. It's already been announced what's going to happen. And yet, they don't budge. I know the bell's rung. Do we have that kind of fearless faith? Doesn't matter what's going on around us. That doesn't influence us. We stand for what's right because right is right even if nobody else believes it and nobody else is doing it. Lots for us to see in these chapters. Thank you all very much for your uh, participation and attention this morning.